Coming up on this week's edition of NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. We'll examine how NCBA sets its policy priorities and why this producer-driven process is so important to the success of the beef industry. Plus, a behind-the-scenes look at the Montana Stock Growers mid-year meeting. Now, from the Denver headquarters of the National Cattlemen's Beef Association, it's NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. Hello and welcome to NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. I'm Kevin Auctioner. Today, we're taking a closer look at NCBA's policymaking process, which begins at state and regional cattle associations across the U.S. Every piece of NCBA policy starts this way, from discussions and resolutions developed by individual producers at the grassroots level. Cattleman to Cattleman reporter Brad Bulla has more on the importance of this process and explains why it's key to NCBA's continued success. Each year, more than 7,000 cattlemen and women attend the annual Cattle Industry Convention. The Cattle Industry Summer Business Meeting draws a smaller crowd, but at both of these meetings, producers who volunteer to represent their states join in committee work and participate in the NCBA board meeting to vote on every policy issue. Our members are very take a lot of pride in what they push forward at the national level. That process works. The committee process at the national level works. Everybody gets a voice, and even though not every single member from Missouri can come to the national convention, they elect delegates to represent them, and they do a good job doing that. But we so often say it goes back to the state. It goes back to the state affiliates. We can't forget the county. I mean, it starts at the county level, and without these county affiliates, we have no state affiliates. We have no state affiliates, we have no national affiliates. So it really starts at the county level. I think it's important for producers to realize sometimes we, we uh, discredit our, our ability to, to effectuate positive change. We think I'm just one person, but again, you have some great ideas and I encourage people to get involved in their state cattlemen's organizations to share their ideas um, and again to join forces with others to come up with the, the best possible solutions for our industry. Again, it starts at the grassroots level and really where we uh, can add to that that the power and the strength is by joining forces with groups like the National Cattlemen's Beef Association, state groups like the North Dakota Stockmen's Association and others, um, where we can see those solutions that start back at home on the ranch, um, again, make changes here all the way in Washington. One example of an NCBA policy position that began at the grassroots producer level is a call for regulation of fake meat, laboratory-grown or plant-based protein products that are marketed as if they were beef, pork, or chicken. So for pork, for chicken, for beef, for any of us, it's not just a beef issue. This is an agriculture issue. This is a marketing with integrity issue. And we have to make sure that for all commodities, that we tell our consumers what it is and they can have trust in that product. Uh, the last thing we want to do is for a consumer to have a bad eating experience and blame one of our members for, or the beef industry for producing a bad product. We have to be honest with our consumer. Certainly the, the, the beef industry is, has competition. We've always had competition. We need to win over um, the hearts, the minds, the stomachs of consumers every single day. Uh, this is a new challenge, however, um, in the, the imitation or the synthetic product. And we've seen some of the similar related challenges in the food industries and other areas. And we want to take a proactive uh, stance on this. So that, po that particular policy starts like all policy do of this organization. I mean, many people think that staff or a few of us in a closed room come up with these ideas and these policies and that's absurd. It's simply not true. The fact of the matter is that particular policy came from a county cattlemen's group in Missouri, moved up to the state level, and then was voted on by our policy committee and then our board of directors, and then we moved it forward at the national level. And then other states had done the same thing, so we got together with, I don't want to miss anybody, so six other states and we all came together and introduce that policy at the national level together. Um, that's how every single policy works. There's not a single policy at the national cattlemen's level or at the state level that came from staff or came from uh, a group of five. I mean, it's really, truly grassroots. Since NCBA members approved the policy on fake meat, the NCBA Washington staff has been working on Capitol Hill and at federal agencies pressing for regulation of these products that could threaten beef in the consumer marketplace. And for leaders of state cattle organizations, 
It's another example of the need for producers themselves to join together and lead the way on issues they care about. We think that some of the best ideas come from our producers themselves. Again, they're, they're dealing with those issues, contemplating those challenges, and looking forward to the, the future of their industry and the future of their families and their businesses. And so, again, by joining forces with our, our colleagues across the country, um, we can be stronger and, and, again, hopefully have some positive results on this topic and many others. If you want a voice, if you want to be heard, get involved, get engaged, whether it's this organization or any organization for that matter. If you want to be involved in the process, you want to understand the process, don't sit on the sidelines. I mean, it's easy to throw rocks and say we're top down or this and that when you're sitting on the sidelines. Get involved, get engaged, and then by golly, your voice will be heard and you will see that it's not top down. It's really, like I said, from the county up. I'm Brad Buller reporting for NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. And joining us now is Barb Wilkinson, NCBA's Senior Executive Director of Governance and Leadership. Barb, why do you think NCBA's policy-making process is so critical to our organization? Kevin, without it, we wouldn't have a playbook for our Washington, D.C. staff. It starts at the grassroots level, and on we go. We, it's just the way we do a business. And, and this process is going to be on display this week during the uh, summer business meeting. Uh, tell folks why that meeting is so important to our business. That meeting is really important because just like it says, it's business meeting. They're taking care of the policy of the organization and making sure that the policies are done right. But those policies didn't start at that meeting. They started back at the county level and at the state level. What will be happening is our state partners will be gathering in committees to vote on the resolutions that are brought forth. So, so I wanted to tee up on, on that topic just a little bit more. Uh, what is the role of the state cattle organizations in this meeting and in the policymaking process itself? The states are our eyes and ears for what's going on out in the country, and they truly are the foundation of our process. Without them, we would not have a process. They bring forth the resolutions. They bring forth the people to vote on them. And then the next thing is we need to continue to use them to keep those eyes and ears open, and they will even go and lobby on Washington D in Washington, D.C. Absolutely. You and I both know summer's a busy time for lots of cattle producers. Uh, we've got uh, hay in season and county fairs and all those sorts of things. If folks can't make it to Denver, um, how would you recommend they get engaged in this process? We're a realist. We know not everybody can be in Denver. The place to start is at the county level. Get involved at first at the county level or at the state level. We also realize people have different seasons in their lives when they can be active and when they maybe not are able to be active. So get active where you can. If it's at the county level, great. If it's at the state level, and we'd sure love to see you at the national meeting. But make sure your voice is heard. And speaking of getting active, uh, the first step of being active is becoming a member. Why is now such a good time to be an NCBA member, Bart? There is not a more important time to be a member. There are fewer of us. Our voice needs to be strong, and we need to have everybody as part of the process. We need the support. We can't have everybody at every meeting, but if we can say we have this many members, it's really important to help, especially in Congress. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for coming and shedding some light on what for some is a complex process of policymaking. We appreciate that. Thank you, Kevin. The best way to stay up to date on all the latest industry news and information is by becoming a member of NCBA. You'll receive the members only Beltway Beef newsletter a weekly update straight from Washington that gives valuable insights on the key policy initiatives that can impact your business. To get the Beltway Beef Newsletter and other exclusive members-only benefits, join NCBA by calling 866-233-3872 or you can visit the website ncba.org. Still ahead on NCBA's Cattlemen and Cattlemen, We'll visit the mid-year meeting of the Montana Stock Growers Association to learn more about this fun and informative event. Plus, a look at how the Public Lands Council is celebrating its 50th anniversary. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Don't miss your chance to read The National Cattleman. It's the official publication of NCBA. And it's packed with timely news and information about the issues and events that affect your cattle business. Plus, the National Cattleman includes producer education, cattle market insights, and more. A subscription is free when you become a member of NCBA. Join now by calling 866-233-3872. 
or on the web at ncba.org. At Case IH, we believe it's our job to provide you with solutions. That's why our Farmall and Maxim tractors, as well as our tools and attachments, are designed with you in mind. From mowing to baling to loading and more, we're here to help turn your to-dos into to-dones. At Case IH, we'll keep your days running smoothly with equipment that's durable, versatile, and highly efficient. No wonder farmers are more loyal to Case IH than any other brand. Visit your local dealer or go to caseih.com forward slash livestock for more. Well, I think a rancher has to be a steward of the land. There's nobody else that can take care of land better than a rancher. When we switched over to the uh, Perina products, it was a step in the right direction. The difference we see in the cattle is the consistency of their nutrition. The cattle hold their condition a lot better throughout the whole year. It does make a difference that we can see, day in and day out. Welcome back. State cattle conventions are a great way for local producers to meet and begin developing policy positions that they may one day present to NCBA for consideration. Lane Nordland has a look at the Montana Stock Growers Mid-Year Meeting, which offers a great mix of work and fun. As cattlemen and women meet with their respective livestock associations here this summer, the Montana Stock Growers Association held their annual mid-year meeting in Dillon, Montana. This year, ranchers were able to connect with consumers, elected and appointed officials, and by doing this, they are sharing the importance of the Western way of life and bridging the gap between Washington, D.C. and the countryside. Well, one, it says a lot about our organization that they feel it's important enough to take the time to, to come to our summer convention. It's an opportunity to get to know them better, for them to get to know us better, and to just to share our thoughts on, on whatever issue is important to us. One issue that is very important to livestock producers in western states is having the right to graze public lands. In Montana alone, there is over 27 million acres, or 29% of the state, that is administered by five federal agencies. For public lands ranchers, it's vital that federal agencies understand the role grazing plays in keeping range and forest land healthy. This is a big part of what we do, as you know. Uh, we uh, manage 245 million acres of surface estate, and part of what Congress told us to do is to manage that for public lands grazing uh, and to come up with things that work. So it's always important for us to come together, meet with stakeholders, and find out how we're doing. Uh, what processes are working, what may not be working, uh, and find innovations if we can. Public lands ranchers also know it's very important to share their story with their peers in the livestock industry. I think it's really hard. Being from the South, it's hard to understand it till you really see it. Uh, we all have a lot of shared problems and a lot of shared concerns, and we do things, a lot of things the same way, but they have an extra level of uh, hoops they have to jump through so to speak and really until you see it and you talk to the folks and you hear how they have to manage their uh, public land allotments every day it's really hard to understand so I encourage you know any of the elected officials and we try to encourage that with our eastern guys and our Tennessee delegation that we need to support our brothers because we're all in the cattle business together. Cattlemen and women know the importance of creating and fostering relationships with elected and appointed officials, and they appreciate when these leaders take the time to listen to their concerns. No, it's, it is important, but I think it's important for them too, because they realize that we are the voting body and that kind of what stock growers, you know, the policy that we pass will affect them later. So if you're not at the table, you're on it, and uh, they know that, you know, we're stepping up and, and we're at that table and in the conversation and they want to know what we're thinking and, and what, you know, the people that elect them, you know, want. Number one is you see you have an administration who are starting to put people in key positions that affect our lives every day who believe that agriculture is part of the solution, they're not part of the problem. 
you know, we had an attitude coming out of D.C., frankly, that uh, felt like at times we were almost at war with administrations of, of the past. Now uh, we have people who, they are uh, homegrown folks, they understand the way of the West, but importantly, they're coming out, they're getting out of their ivory towers, and they're getting out here to places like Montana, spending time in pickups, spending time walking around the pastures, spending time up in the, the grazing areas on our public lands, and it's so important we keep multiple use critically important. You know, we have certain fringe extreme groups who want to lock all this up and remove literally generations of ranchers that have uh, responsibly been stewards of the land and have grazed it. We need to fight every day to protect that. I, I feel real uh, ties to this community and uh, so I want to get it right and I, and I think that in terms of listening uh, that's what we have to do and uh, the Trump administration and uh, Ryan Zinke in particular really does care about uh, how we're doing uh, with our interaction with, with those that rely on public lands. Public lands grazing is just one of the many issues that the NCBA and state affiliates like the Montana Stock Growers Association along with the Public Lands Council are working on to make sure that cattlemen and women have a future in the livestock industry. Reporting for NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen, I'm Lane Nordland. One great reason to become an NCBA member is the chance to read the National Cattleman. It's the official publication of NCBA and provides timely news and articles about the issues and events affecting the beef industry. A subscription is included free of charge when you become a member. Just call 1-866-233-3872 or you can visit the website ncba.org. Still to come on Cattlemen to Cattlemen, the Public Lands Council is throwing a special celebration this year. We'll tell you why and how you can be part of the fun. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Public land issues are somewhat unique. The Public Lands Council is um, valuable to the ranchers because it's someone out there that's speaking their language. Somebody has to communicate with the agencies, uh, the BLM, the Forest Service, Fish and Wildlife. Well, the Public Lands Council has provided incredible information and help, I think, to all members of the Congress. Everything from water rights to endangered species to wildfire to the need to actively manage the lands through grazing. And there's always a new battle coming up. Uh, the people on the land know much better what's good for them, their land, and their community than anybody in Washington ever will or ever has. So for them to have someone who is out there helping send their message and helping them keep their industry alive, that's super important for them. Uh, there's no way you can really put a value on what they do for us. So having someone in Washington, D.C., a, a voice for the industry, a voice for public land ranching, such as PLC, Public Lands Council, is huge. Say goodbye to your toughest pasture and rangeland weeds for good. Because one product offers season-long control, handles the widest spectrum of broadleaf weeds, and clears the way for increased forage with greater grazing flexibility. So you get more beef per acre at a cost that can't be beat. It's Grazon Next HL Herbicide. And if it's in your pastures, plain and simple, weeds won't be. Welcome back. The Public Lands Council is celebrating a major milestone this year, its 50th anniversary. Russell Nemitz has a look at what PLC has planned for this historic occasion. Public lands have long been part of ranching in the West. Today there are more than 22,000 American ranchers grazing livestock on 250 million acres of public lands. Representing those ranchers and fighting for them on critical policy issues is the mission of the Public Lands Council, or PLC. In 1968 is when it was originally formed. That was about the same time that uh, laws like the NEPA was going, the endangered species. Uh, you, you know, a lot of bad things were happening towards the, the public lands ranching. And so the wool growers and the cattlemen decided maybe they should get together because they really didn't have anything that just focused on public lands issues, which are a lot different than 
you know, a regular run on private land. So they formed this together and it's slowly, it's, it's built up over the years, it's done a lot of good. One thing that's been constant is, is the PLC has been there to serve as a voice for that part of the industry that runs on public land, that uses federal grazing permits. And anyone who's familiar with the way the West was settled and, and homestead and, and, and then you know you have these wide open expanses of, of federal land that became part of the Taylor Grazing Act, became part of you know, what we now know as the BLM and Forest Service grazing system, PLC has been there for the last 50 years to represent the interests of those producers because they're so unique. Our guys in the West have every one of the concerns that a producer anywhere else in the country has. They just have this additional layer of pressure that is unimaginable to a rancher in any other part of the country. With a full-time staff based in Washington, D.C., producer members of the Public Lands Council meet each spring and fall to set policy priorities and to provide a unified voice on issues that can often threaten their ability to continue ranching on western lands. Uh, one thing, uh, you know, we've got a great staff here in Washington, do a great job, and well connected, and, and it's, it's been a great thing. You know, a lot of these things that are good, doing in our favor wouldn't be possible without, without uh, the Public Lands Council. Yes, I'm very, very committed to it. I, I, the more have I got involved, the more I see the importance of it. I think the mission of PLC is more important now than it's ever been. Uh, here we sit at a time when news has been uh, hypercharged. We have not just 24-hour news cycles anymore, we have a continuous news cycle. We have organizations that are opposed to our way of life that are funded beyond anything we can possibly imagine. If you look at the budget of the Humane Society of the United States, we're talking about something north of $400 million. Western Watersheds, $10 million. Center for Biological Diversity, et cetera. These groups have one purpose, and that is to put animal agriculture, and ranchers in particular, out of business. There has never been a time when it's more important for PLC to be engaged and waging this battle for producers across the West coordinating the efforts of those state cattle and sheep associations that do so much work on the ground on these issues. While there are always threats to public lands grazing, the leaders of PLC say the current political landscape in Washington, D.C. is more friendly to public lands ranchers than it has been in many years. We're happy Trump and uh, Secretary Zink was able to reduce Bears Ears and the Grand Staircase Escalante. That, that was really a great great boost for us, but PLC is working hard to try to get some of these things corrected, working there. This administration has been really, really good to work with. Seems like the last few years we've just kind of gone backwards, a little more regulation, but now things are kind of moving in our favor a little bit. We're focused on getting some work done for producers around the country while we have an administration that's open to listening to some of our concerns and making some headway. It's really a, really kind of a, a time crunch. We don't, we don't know for sure if uh, Trump's going to be reelected. We don't you know this election year now and we might, he might do, lose the House or the Senate. Uh, so right now we've, we've kind of got things in our favor and so we're trying to make hay while the sun shines. Formed in 1968, the Public Lands Council celebrates its 50th anniversary this year with what may be their biggest meeting ever coming up in late September. We are going to have a 50th anniversary celebration in Park City, Utah, September 27th to the 29th this year. Uh, we were just out there last week on a site visit, and I can tell you this is going to be the best uh, PLC meeting I've ever been to. So we, uh, uh, we really hope anybody who's interested, who wants to learn more about these issues, who wants to engage, comes out to uh, spend a couple days with us in Park City because it will be the place to be if these are issues that are important to you. We'd sure love to have a lot of producers come and, and, and watch that and be with us. Uh, because it is, it's important. I mean, other organizations do a good job too, but we're the only ones that work specifically on public lands. I'm Russell Nimitz reporting for NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. For more information on the issues that impact federal lands and the ranchers that graze there, be sure to visit the website publiclandscouncil.org. You can also get details on how to attend the 50th annual meeting coming up on September 27th in Park City, Utah. Still ahead on Cattlemen to Cattlemen, we'll talk with one U.S. representative to get his thoughts on some of the important issues that could impact public lands ranchers. Stay with us. We'll be right back.
When you're in the cattle business, no matter how much it's a business, it still starts with cattle. It's this basic notion that sits at the core of how we approach things at Beringer Engelheim. We understand when you put the cattle first, it just naturally leads to doing the right things. If you want to do well in this business, you start by doing right. Take care of the cattle, and they'll take care of you. What does it mean to be dependable? It means you do what you say you'll do time and time again. Because performance isn't optional, and your task is essential. For over 95 years, we have proven ourselves to be the most dependable choice. That's why the cattlemen of this great nation trust Ritchie to provide fresh water on demand. Ritchie, proud to be a partner to the American cattlemen since 1921. Welcome back. The staff of the National Cattlemen's Beef Association works each day to ensure our nation's lawmakers understand the issues that are important to cattle producers. Cattleman to Cattleman reporter Russell Nemitz caught up with one U.S. representative to get his thoughts on some of the issues that are important to cattle producing families. A lot of important issues are worked on in the House's Natural Resources Committee, more specifically for the U.S. livestock industry, grazing issues, specifically for ranchers who graze our nation's public lands. And with us on the program today is Congressman Rob Bishop from Utah, and he's the chairman of the House Natural Resource Committee. And we could spend all day talking about a lot of these different issues. I've got a few of them I want to cover for sure with you today, Congressman. Let's start with a big one for West ranchers and that's sage grouse. Well sage grouse is one of those issues that we have actually addressed it in the house and we need to keep addressing it. The, the biggest problem this administration is doing some great things in trying to roll back some of the regulations that the other administration just superimposes a one-size-fits-all on everything. The problem is sage grouse was initiated as a result of a lawsuit so there was a legal standard for it and until you statutorily deal with that issue to guarantee state plans can go forward and try and work out, then anybody can sue and, and have a judge simply overturn everything that the administration is trying to do and that states are trying to do and impose some other judicial decision. That can't be. So every state has a plan that is designed for their state and would work for their state but they need about 10 years to prove that it will be successful, especially on an issue of a bird that really is not endangered in the first place. Mm -hmm. We got sage grouse, we hunt sage grouse. But you, you have to have a plan that actually works at how you have their habitat, their breeding areas affected, specifically how you stop fires from burning out all their leks. That's not what the federal plan was and any court could actually reverse that. That's why we got to do something statutorily. You know, that kind of plays off of the fact a lot of groups like the Public Lands Council and even the National Cattlemen's Beef Association and others have been calling for meaningful reform for the actual Federal Endangered Species Act itself. Yeah, and once again, that's a difficult path because so much of it is done through the judicial process. But it needs to have reform. What the original intent was has been sub subverted over the years by a lot of interest groups that make money by suing the federal government and they enjoy that opportunity. Uh, that, is, that is frustrating for us. There has to be some kind of reform to the Endangered Species Act because the very nature of the Endangered Species Act right now is simply to set aside land as if that will solve the problem. But nothing is actually going down there to come up with a plan to actually to improve the species and rehabilitate the species. That's what our goal should be. That's not the goal of the Endangered Species Act. What about the Antiquities Act? I mean, you folks in Utah have seen firsthand what the 1906 Antiquities Act could mean for landowners and ranchers and others in states like Utah. I mean, what about meaningful reform for that, too? Once, one, oh, geez. <laughs> It's the same thing over and over again. When the bill was passed, it gave legislative power to an executive, which was a dumb idea. However, the, the original bill has some sideboards on there to make sure that presidents do not abuse that power. And of the 16 presidents who have used the act, 13 did not abuse it. Three have. Unfortunately, there are three of our last five presidents who have abused that. So the last administration just went rampant in just ignoring the provisions of the act itself. 
So we have either two, well, we have one choice, is to go back there and statutorily change the act, and we do have a wonderful bill in the House that would do that, simply to ensure that people have, you know, people in the area in which these monuments would be designated have the right to have input, and that you would actually go back to the original concepts of the Antiquities Act is to save an antiquity, not just corral as much land as you can and change its definition of what its public purpose should be. So if, if the presidents would simply not abuse the act and go back to the original letter of the law and follow that, there really wouldn't be a problem. But we've had presidents now who have abused it re, re, uh, continuously, and interest groups that now realize instead of going through a legislative process as they ought to, which is laborious and takes time, just go to a president and convince him to just ignore the law and ignore Congress and do it with a proclamation. That's a problem. It's got to stop. As I mentioned at the top of the segment, I mean, you folks on the House side, more specifically the House Natural Resource Committee, are working on some very important issues for, for U.S. agriculture, U.S. livestock producers. How frustrating is it as you guys work on big issues like this only to hit the Senate's filibuster roadblock where everything just stalls out over in that chamber? It is incredibly difficult for us. We repeatedly pass these things in the House. But the filibuster rule in the Senate, which was originally designed to ensure there was debate, is once again being abused, like the Antiquities Act is being abused. So that now any jerk senator can simply threaten a filibuster and they don't even talk about it in the first place. In fact, when we try to negotiate with senators, they won't even broach certain issues because they said we, we can't break the filibuster logjam. And certain special interest groups realize they can go to a specific senator and say, don't do this. That senator can then just invoke the filibuster right, put a hold on the legislation, and nothing ever happens. Here's the bottom line. As long as the filibuster rule remains in the Senate, nothing's going to take place. And I recognize why people are so, so, so frustrated. They said they voted for a change in the last election. They gave the House, the Senate kind of, and the presidency to Republicans, and nothing has changed. And I agree, nothing has changed. It's frustrating for us because one jerk senator can actually stop anything from happening just by threatening a filibuster, not even going down and talking. Just the threat of a filibuster stops it to the point they won't even negotiate on anything where they think there would be a threat to the filibuster. If we're going to make changes, the filibuster rule has to, has to leave. Now, a lot of people will say, well, you know, the filibuster can stop bad things from happening. That's half of the story and true. But if something bad is already in existence, you can never get out of it because of a filibuster. If the Senate was simply voting on a majority, majority basis, as the House has for the last century, you can pass a lot of things with 51 bad votes, but you can also get out of a lot of bad things with 51 votes. So this is the idea of, you know, bad things will, will be passed, even with good intentions. How do, can you reform them in the future? And as long as there is a filibuster, there will never be any change. There will never be any reform. All these issues we're talking about, we're just wasting our breath. We can get them done in the House. I can't in the Senate, and only because of the procedural rule known as the filibuster. Congressman Bishop, thanks for joining us on Cattleman to Cattleman. I, I appreciate it, and, and keep up the good work, because obviously, you know, if without you guys, I waste away into nothing. <laughs> well, we appreciate him in all seriousness. Join us on the program and for sharing your thoughts and, more importantly, your candid common sense uh, that echoes and resonates well out there in farm and ranch country. Kevin, with that, we'll go ahead and send it back to you. If you'd like to learn more about what's happening with NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen, you can find us on Facebook. Be sure to like our page and we'll keep you updated with photos, details on upcoming shows, and much more. And it's a great way to connect with other cattlemen and women all across the country. So check us out on Facebook. Still ahead on Cattlemen to Cattlemen, see how John Deere equipment helps a Georgia man work more efficiently on his farm. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Are you concerned about the impact government policies could have on your cattle business? One way to make your voice heard in Washington is by joining NCBA. When you join, you'll have access to key policy updates and insights from Beltway Beef. It's the best way to hear directly from NCBA's DC team. Beltway Beef provides valuable policy information and it's free for NCBA members. Stay in touch with Beltway Beef. Join now at ncba.org. I find that the Public Lands Council does a great job in representing my members. Having someone like the Public Lands Council in Washington, D.C. is huge for us. Every time we have a change of administration, 
you got a new educational process that needs to take place. And the Public Lands Council does a really good job of that, of sharing kind of the reality of what the ranchers deal with every day to those who aren't that exposed to it. I think PLC plays a great role in helping to uh, inform and help uh, uh, political leaders to understand uh, the nuances that take place on public lands. Uh, we obviously can't get away all the time uh, to go to Washington, D.C. and to argue these issues. There are very, very few groups as small as the public land ranchers in the West that have a track record where they were that effective. In terms of working with the Public Lands Council, I'll tell you as one senator, I want to work with them, I want to stand with them, and I want to fight for them because they represent the people of our communities. For many in the cattle business, even though they love being on the land, there's a need to have an off-farm job to provide benefits and additional income. Then the challenge becomes finding time in the early mornings, the late evenings, and on the weekends to get the cattle cared for and all the chores done. Cattleman to Cattleman reporter Brian Baxter takes us to Georgia for the story of one cattle producer who has become a master at balancing the demands of two different worlds. In southeast Georgia, Blizzard Farms is now in the capable hands of David Blizzard, who's the third generation to work this land. This farm has been called Blizzard Farms from my grandfather on down to me. Uh, my daddy started uh, full-time farming, I believe, 1972. And he and my granddaddy were partners. And I was uh, more or less a high school hired hand on the farm. I've got about 60 mama cows. I'm trying to get to 80 mama cows. Uh, my calving rate's usually around 90% a year. Uh, I usually use uh, three to four bulls, and I alternate different breeds of bulls about every three years just to keep my crossbreeding in check. In addition to caring for his cows, producing a hay crop, and growing sunflowers as a wildlife food plot, David has just wrapped up a full-time job as a rural mail carrier. I have had, for the last 35 years, a full-time job off the farm. Uh, I'm approaching retirement. Actually, in two days, I'll be officially retired from that. So I hope to be able to do this with a little less stress on me. And that's my plan. <laughs> Raising cattle is enjoyable. After an agitating day of delivering mail and riding up and down the road, stopping five or six hundred times a day, going out there around the cows in the afternoon or just before dark, and uh, there's a lot of therapy out there. They, they seem relaxed and it helps me relax and wind down a little bit as long as everything's going okay. Uh, I enjoy it. Working to balance his off-farm job, David developed strategies that helped him get his farm work done as quickly and easily as possible. Good grass grows good cows. If you can bale the hay in a timely manner, I cut my hay with a conditioner and I've learned to tet it as quickly as I can get to it with the conditioner to get it spread out over the ground. I'm a, pretty much a one-man operation. My wife and children, they help me move equipment up and down the road a little bit. And that's one reason I have tried to keep new equipment, good equipment that I could depend on that when I get ready to go to work, I don't have to spend that two hours in the afternoon working on it. I, need, I can take it and go ahead and, and be productive with it. Uh, those are the challenges I had. So the cattle industry in this area is a uh, majority of part-time producers, I would say. 90% um, of the guys that we deal with have full-time jobs still to help supplement their uh, income. Uh, a lot of them have grown up on farms, family farms, passed down generation to generation. Um, they're trying to keep that going throughout the family. There's no doubt balancing an off-farm job can create time pressures and the potential for fatigue when it's time to tackle the farm work. Those challenges were part of the reason David decided to continue upgrading to newer, more comfortable tractors. Both my cab tractors have air ride seats in them. They're very comfortable. Uh, even if I've been sitting in them four or five hours, if I change the setting, I can change the backrest, change the armrest, change the softness of the firmness of the seat itself. Uh, and that's a little refreshing, you know, as I'm working. The tractor, the 5100 R is quick. You can turn it around quick, back up to something quickly. The hydraulics are just great on it. Uh, 
the loader that feather it a little bit, it, it'll pick a bale of hay up quick or it'll drop it quick. Uh, you can dump it off quick. Uh, but it is very easy to feed hay with. I stand my bales up on end in the hay rings. You can pull up to a hay ring, get your net wrap off and dump it right in there very easy and get away from it. Uh, just, just a joy to run them. Especially since I've got two cab tractors now, I can put on pretty nice clothes and get in there and do what I want to do and get out and me and my wife go out and eat supper. I never have to take a shower or wash the dust off of it. Beyond the tractors, David recently worked with his dealer, Ag Pro, in Milledgeville, Georgia, to step up his haying capacity by getting a new round baler as well. So Mr. David um, was one of our very first customers when we came to town uh, back in 2014. He's probably one of our first hay balers that we got out in the field. He was running an older baler, twine only, and uh, we stopped and talked to him about the 469 balers with the uh, net wrap option, which was a big deal for uh, speed when you're in the field getting done as quick as possible. We got in with him and was talking with him. And we were able to get that baler sold to him, and from there it kind of snowballed, I guess you could say. He's, uh, he's been one of our uh, best and favorite customers to work with since we've been here in the last four years. So I made the decision to buy a 469 with net wrap, and then three, I ran it three summers, and now I've just traded for this 460M silage, and uh, thinking that maybe in the future I may want to get into haylage, uh, but I have to take it one step at a time. Still learning, still improving, and still working to make the family farm and his cow herd better each year, David Blizzard is excited to carry on a long family tradition in the job he truly enjoys. I like baling hay. <laughs> uh, with these tractors and equipment, man, if you get in a field of 40 or 50 acres in it, in six to seven hours, you can go by and you look at all those bales you dropped off, that's a good feeling. You've had a productive day. And, uh, you know, you got something to feed your cows through the winter. So, anyway, it's a good feeling. At Blizzard Farms in southeast Georgia, I'm Brian Baxter for NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. If you'd like to learn more about how tractors and hay equipment from John Deere can bring value to your farm or ranch, visit the website johndeere.com. And don't forget, John Deere is adding more value to your NCBA membership by offering special discounts on riding lawn equipment, compact utility tractors, and much more. Deer is just one of many companies offering exclusive deals. Become a member today by calling 866-233-3872 or visiting the website ncba.org. Still ahead, it's time for a visit with our good friend, Baxter Black. Stay with us, we'll be right back. No matter what job I've got to do, my John Deere 5E tractor can do it all. Whether I'm cutting, moving feed, or building a fence. Using my 5E means my work gets done faster at a price I can afford, and that works for me. We know you're up before the dawn because the cattle rise before the sun. And you spend long hours in the saddle because the herd isn't always over the next rise. And you care for the land because you know it takes care of your family. And we know you do great work. And it's time to tell that story to the marketplace. I am I Global is here to help you do just that. Ladies and gentlemen and followers of Cowboy Humor, I have carved another book for my funny bone guaranteed to tickle your humorous. Ah, sorry. The title is Scrambled Wisdom. Almost isn't is, is it? Which almost makes sense. It's only $19.95 plus shipping. Call 800-654-2550 or online at baxterblack.com. Here's a joke. What did he get on his IQ test? Drool. Have you ever put yourself in the position of a calf being born? Well, I'm going to put you there. Say, anybody got a light? Sure is dark in here, and tighter than the skin on Polish sausage. For nine long months, I've trusted Mom. But now she's pulled the plug, a pure and simple case of double crossage. I'm not sure what I really am, or even what I'm for. 
to breed? Or do they plan to milk us? I've checked myself the best I could. The bull calf's what I think. But heck, that might be my umbilicus. Hey, close the door. I feel a draft. And get your hands off me. Nobody said I had to relocate. The way you're pawing at my foot and pulling on my leg, you probably never had a second date. Oh, chains. <laughs> That's nice. I guess this means the honeymoon is over, and I'd been counting on a baby shower to celebrate my coming out so you could lavish me with medicated gifts so I won't scour. But as it is, you're dragging this whole project out too long. Your midwife skills are lax and don't assure me. <laughs> well, don't stop now. Please let me get where I can turn my head. I'm feeling like a piece of taxidermy. Whoa. What's that pipe with all the hooks and the evil looking levers? You dummies plan on building you a bridge? Wait, don't tell me. Let me guess, a fetal calf extractor for uterine abuse and pilferage. Way to go. Now I'm hip locked. You're working up a sweat and smelling like a pair of dirty socks. I'm swinging like a pendulum. What's that a hanging down? Is that my breakfast there between the hawks? Get out the way, I'm bailing out. <laughs> Too bad we met like this. But you might be all right, at least I think. And to show there's no hard feelings, belly up here to the bag, and I'll buy you and all your friends a drink. This is Baxter Black from in there. Thanks, Baxter. I can't say I've ever looked at it quite like that. Want to rewatch an episode of Cattleman to Cattleman or catch up on anything you've missed? Then visit our YouTube page. You'll find replays of all of our shows filled with educational segments and producer profiles from all around the country. It's also another chance to see Baxter Black, so check us out on YouTube. We'll be back with more Cattleman to Cattleman right after this. Stay with us. Do you know all you need to about working cattle? Did you know there are proven methods that can reduce stress for the animals, for you and your crew? Now there's an easy way for you to learn from the experts who can help sharpen your stockmanship and stewardship skills. In interactive sessions, you'll learn better ways to work cattle more efficiently, skills that can help put more money in your pocket. Find out more and locate an upcoming event near you at the website stockmanshipandstewardship.org. Let's go to New Orleans and the 2019 Cattle Industry Convention and NCBA Trade Show. It's the cattle industry's biggest convention for the first time ever in Cajun country, the Big Easy, a place filled with fun, food, and incredible sights. And you can't afford to miss the huge NCBA Trade Show. Oh, this trade show is fantastic. I mean, it's so much fun to come down here. There's no better place for cattlemen and women to learn, have fun, and connect with fellow producers from across the country. Networking, see the people. I mean, you learn a lot here. Amazing speakers, unbeatable education, all for cattle producers in the Big Easy. So plan now to go to New Orleans for the 2019 Cattle Industry Convention and NCBA Trade Show. January 30th through February 1st. Visit ncba.org for more. There is a new world out there, revealing itself in unpredictable ways. A world that demands more from the land and those who grow, farm, and build on it. This new world calls for the ingenuity to get more out of it while preserving as much as we can. After all, to stay ahead of tomorrow, we need to be equipped for it today. Welcome back. As a viewer of NCBA's Cattleman to Cattleman, we want to hear from you. If you have questions or comments, or even a story idea for us, Drop us an email, and we may use them on a future show. Send us your thoughts at our email address, c2c 
at beef.org. And you can always reach us and NCBA through the website ncba.org. We're wrapping up this week's show with legacy photos as we share with you some great shots submitted by our viewers all across the U.S. Let's take a look. Want to see your photo on Cattlemen and Cattlemen? You can submit your favorite shots a couple of ways. Either message them to us on the Cattlemen and Cattlemen Facebook page or email them to c2c at beef.org. Include your ranch or farm name and your hometown, and we may use them on a future episode. Well, that wraps up this edition of NCBA's Cattlemen and Cattlemen. Thanks so much for spending time with us. We'll see you again next week right here on RFD TV.